At Family Church, we celebrate the death and burial and resurrection of Jesus uh, all the time. But once a month, we, we celebrate using the Lord's Supper and communion. And if you're watching us regularly online, I think it'd be a great idea if you would have a cracker and juice or if you'd have some way that you can celebrate with us so that in the service time when we actually have communion, you can share that with us wherever you are. I hope you can do that today. There are some things that we never forget as kids. Uh, how many of you have an older brother? <laughs> I have, I'm the youngest of four, and uh, one day, my, I was 10 years old at the time, my brother was uh, 18, and we went up to get a Christmas tree, and we lived kind of out in the country, and so beyond our place was this vast forest and, um, and open land, and so, and so we were about a mile and a half, maybe two miles up, and uh, we were walking down this dirt logging road. And up this nice fur uh, on this dead limb was a bobcat. That was the first time I'd ever seen, and it's the only time I've seen a bobcat out in the wilds like that. And uh, at the time, there was a bounty on them. And so my brother's, you know, calculating that in his head, all of that $10 or whatever it was. And, um, and so he said, I'm going to go back and get the gun. And so... He's heading back, and I get about halfway, and I say, you know, you go get the gun. I'm going to sit here and wait. So, um, so finally, he goes back, and, fi and, and I'm thinking, by the time we get back, that cat's going to be gone. So we walk back, get to the same place, look up, and it's still there. And so he, uh, he takes his gun, takes aim, and pow, that bobcat falls right into the thickets, right into a berry pile, and... Um, and, uh, you know, just, just a bunch of, of, of uh, weeds and stuff. And, and so I'm standing there, you know, my, ha my heart's pounding, and his heart's pounding, and we're watching and say, okay, what's going to happen next? Is that cat going to get up? And uh, we looked at each other and said, is it dead? <laughs> He's holding a gun. He says, I don't know. Go find out. <laughs> so I'm not going to do that. He said, I've got the gun. I'm going to hold it. You're going to be okay. You check to make sure that cat's dead. So, younger brother, older brother. So, I crawl in, and of course, it's down in the brush. There's all this over, and I'm, I can see it there, and its head's that way. I want to stay, you know, if, he, I'm, if he's going to run, he's going to have to turn around. So, I grab a stick, and I'm going in, and I poke that cat. And you know what happened? Nothing. <laughs> it was dead. But my old heart was just a pounding, and uh, never forgot that. But that was a, uh, uh, you know, I think, I think there's so many things that, you know, so many stories that you have about times that you were just scared to death. And uh, the story we have today is several moments in the Old Testament history where, uh, where that is actually true. We're going to be looking at, if you have your Bibles, um, Joshua 1. And we're starting uh, as kind of a background, talking about Moses. Moses, you remember, um, had some scary moments. I think of the time he was tending sheep in the back side of the desert. And uh, while he was tending sheep, a bush was burning that did not burn up. It just kept on burning. And I'm sure that was somewhat frightening. And as he went to the bush, um, God began to speak. Now, that would be frightening. But what God had to say was pretty frightening too because Moses hears God's voice saying, Moses, I want you to go to Egypt and I want you to bring out that nation Israel that's in bondage right now and I want you to go rescue them. And Moses is saying, I don't think that's a good idea. I've tried that before and I failed. And God said, but this time I'm going to be with you. Yes, but God, anyway, there was a little argument going on, and finally Moses decides to go. And when he goes, he's going to meet the most powerful figure, the most powerful man in the world at that time, Pharaoh. Now, that would be a little intimidating and scary, but God was with him, and he had 10 uh, miracles that he saw God perform, and 
God changed Pharaoh's heart, and he let that nation go. And, uh, and so on they, they, they travel out. But when they start heading down the road, Pharaoh changes his mind, and he wants to now bring them back. So now, here, they, here Moses is at, with, at, the, at, the, at the Red Sea getting ready to cross, and he sees the, and finds out that this army is coming after them. And he's scared to death. And God goes before them and opens up that sea and they walk through on dry ground and the army is extinguished. (laughs) So Moses has had these challenges. Um, A few days later, he goes to the Mount Sinai and God gives him the law. And that is the law that um, that says this is, what, this is what the God would have you do once you get into your land. I'm taking you and bringing you into a new land. And so the next character that we're going to talk about is, is Joseph. And Joseph is now standing right on the edge of the Jordan River, ready to cross into the land. Now, Jordan, or, or, or uh, uh, Joshua, is a... Uh, is a little bit intimidated as well. There's a little bit of fear going on here because Moses was the most powerful leader. Uh, in fact, even looking in the New Testament, the, the, just the, the, the heritage of Moses and, and all that he had done, and Joshua had been there as his aide through the desert, through the, uh, the, the plagues and all the things that God had done, and, and, and Moses and, and Joshua were kind of teamed up. But now Joshua is getting the leadership responsibility. How, uh, I mean, that's a powerful thing. That not, only was he, not only was he afraid of the leadership, that was a big responsibility, but he had about two million people to lead. How would you like that assignment? And it wasn't just two million people. It was two million rebellious, stubborn, argumentative people. I can remember when, uh, as a staff pastor here at Family Church, God uh, tapped me on the shoulder and worked through some situations where God wanted me to step in and be the lead pastor here. And I go, God, this, that's too big. And God says, I'll be with you. And I, and I made an agreement with God. I said, God, I'll take the position and I'll sit in the chair, that leadership chair every day if you'll do the work in me. The day that I don't feel like you're there, I'm done because it's too big. And I think that's where Joshua was at. He, just, he said, I'll step in to this big role and I will trust you, but it's too big for me. You ever been in that place? You're in a leadership place. You're in a place in your life and it's just too big for you. Yeah, that's when God does his best work. So standing on the edge of the Jordan, this is where our story begins. So Joshua 1, uh, and God is speaking now to, to Joshua, and he says this, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now then, you and all these people get ready to cross the Jordan River into the land that I am about to give them, to the Israelites. I will give you every place where your feet, or your foot, uh, where, you, where you set your foot, as I promised Moses. I will give you every place where, you're, where you, you set your foot. Also, no one will be able to stand against you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will never leave you or forsake you. Everywhere you go is yours. Nobody will be able to stand against you. I'm not going to leave you or forsake you. I'm going to be with you. And I love the language. This is a gift. This is not something they are having to uh, earn. God has gifted them with this land. He he said, I want you, I, I have provided this as a place for you. I'm giving it to you. What you need to do is show up every day, start walking, start uh, stepping into battles, and I will be with you. God has not changed. That's the life we live. All of us have battles. All of us have challenges. 
And that was his challenge to them. Now, Joshua is right here, getting ready to cross over the Jordan River. And I think Joshua's kind of having this deja vu. He said, I think I remember this conversation happening before. And yeah, 40 years earlier, he, God was having that conversation with Moses, and they were down in Kadesh Barnea after he had given him the law, and they, uh, Joshua was one of 12 spies that went up and, and explored this land all the way up to the Sea of Galilee and back, and one of the promises was is this is a place of, of milk and honey. In fact, when they came back with the report, they were carrying on a pole a cluster of grapes that it took two men to carry. But this is a report that they brought back. Number 13. We went into the land to which you sent us, and it, was, and it does flow with milk and honey. Here is the fruit. <sighs> but the people who live there are powerful, and the cities are walled and fortified, and very large. We even saw the descendants of Anak there. Now, you, when you think of the word Anak, these were, these, these were giants. They go on and say, the land we explore devours those in it. Does that sound fearful? Have that, is that kind of turned to a melting heart? The land that we explore devours those that live in it. All the people we saw there are of great size. We, seem to, we seemed like grasshoppers in our own eyes, and we looked the same to them. We seemed like grasshoppers in our eyes, and we seemed the same to them. Here God was getting ready to give them this land. He was, he was going to give them every, uh, every place their, f their foot was. He was going to be with them. And, but they came back with this report and it scared the people to death. Joshua and another man by the name of Caleb said, Go, we can do this. I know we can make this work. God is with us. And the other ten said, no. And when the, when the two million people heard that, they said, no, we don't believe that. Don't think we can do that. They even said, we, uh, if we go in, we'll be killed, and our wives and kids will be plundered. Let's find a leader to go back to Egypt, which they've been praying for years to get out of bondage of. Last summer, we experienced here in the Northwest something that is experienced around somewhere around Earth every 18 months, a total, total eclipse of the sun. I remember uh, sitting there that morning and watching the moon come between the Earth and the sun, putting on my glasses and all the fear of, do you have the right glasses? Everybody will be blind as, after this day, you know, because you didn't have the right glasses or whatever. But um, put on my glasses, and I watched as the, as the, as the day darkened, kind of eerie, and as the, as the earth cooled. And then it, it, it passed. The, the sun is 864,000 miles wide. The sun is 400 times larger than the moon. Looking at, that, looking at this picture, you would think they're the same size. If, in comparison... This ping pong ball, 400 times that would be an object that is 53 feet in diameter. And yet, uh, something this small made something that big <laughs> disappear. So I want you to, I want you to, uh, do something for me. I want you to look at your thumb. 
Compare that to your body. <laughs> now, take that sum and put it up until I disappear. <laughs> now, you can do that. If you get tired of listening to somebody, you can just make them disappear. <laughs> The, the, sun, the sun or the moon is also 400 times closer to the earth. And so it's not about the size, it's the perspective of distance. And you see, when God is eclipsed by something much smaller, then we get scared. Look into their fear. The land we explored devours those that are living in it. They don't see God. All the people we saw, they weren't seeing God. We're of great size. They look, it looked as big or bigger than God. We seem like grasshoppers in our own eyes, and we look the same to them. God is huge. <laughs> He's the most powerful being on earth, and he is overall and sometimes a small problem, seems like a huge problem to us, eclipses God. And when that happens, we're all in trouble. So, for the next uh, part of, the, uh, of, of what, I'm, what we're going to read in Joshua, is God going back, because this is kind of like, Explore, or this is kind of uh, go into the land 2.0. Here we are again. Last time, 10, uh, 12 tribes went in and they came back and scared all the people. This time, God's saying, Here, I'm going to give you three, three things to remember now as you go into the land. The first one is God's promise. You need to remember God's promise. And so here's, here's what, what we read in verse 6. And he starts out every statement with the same beginning. Be strong and courageous. Be strong and courageous. In other words, be, be confident. Be determined. Be resolved. Rise up when fear comes. And don't let it, the fear eclipse God. Be strong and courageous. And he says, he goes on, because you will lead these people to inherit the land I swore to them, to their ancestors, would be to Abraham and Moses, and for all time they've been, they've been looking at this was going to be their land. And so be strong and courageous. I will lead them into the land. The the Israelites did not go into the land. They have wandered in the desert for 40 years. One year for every day they explored the land. And they must wait in, the, in that desert until everyone who was 20 years old and older died because they were not going to be allowed to go in the land. You know, they had a change of heart when they heard that uh, they were going to be in trouble for not trusting God, and God said, too late. You're not going to get there. And only Joshua and only Caleb were the two that were able to go. But they wandered around for 40 years in the desert. They had no place to really belong, no place to call their own, no ownership. And they were um, fighting over territory from other peoples in the desert. They had no security. They were, they were just kind of out living in tents, wandering in circles, and they really had no purpose. And now God is providing and giving them the land. And he, and he says, go inhabit the land. In that land you will have some ownership. Actually, there will be some, as you take over the land, you will walk into places where there will be um, houses and fields and crops and all that. Just go in and take the land. There will be security. There will be purpose. 
because God had a purpose that he wanted to provide a land and a people that the whole world would be blessed by. If the whole world would see a God who loved these people, who take care of them, he was a powerful God over all kinds of things. And when the people look at the people of Israel who followed and, and trusted God wholeheartedly, the whole world would just go, we have things that we're doing, but that God is, and, and that he would be the attraction of the world. That was God's plan. I want to think about us today. It's not land that we have been promised. God hasn't promised us something, in, in, as I read in, first, or in Ephesians 1.8, uh, prior to this he's saying, uh, Paul is praying this prayer and saying, I, want these, I just want you to understand, church, that you may know what is the hope which he has called you, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance to the saints. And he goes on and he talks about that we have this power in us, this resurrecting power that took Jesus and, and raised him from the dead. And that's the power for people who have placed their faith in Jesus Christ and are now children of God. He goes on, Paul, pre, uh, uh, in his prayer, and he says, and, and God placed all things under Jesus Christ's feet and appointed him the head over everything for the church, which is the body, the fullness of him who fills in every way. And God has this dream, this desire that his church today would be that place where God is changing us, where God is at work in us in powerfully ways that we walk into battles and difficulties and challenges that the world would say, I want what you have. And it impacts, it impacts the world. On your outline, on the other side, there is a list of how God sees you. Here's your inheritance. This is what you inherited when you said yes to Jesus. I want you in my life. And when the Spirit of God came alive in you, this is who you are. You are, you're accepted. You are secure. And you have purpose. You have significance. I just want to read a couple of these. Under accepted, I have been bought with a price and I belong to God. I no longer, the ownership is not mine anymore. I, I belong to God. I have been adopted as his child, and I have been redeemed and forgiven of all sins. Amen? Woo! All sins. Do I still sin? Yeah. And I, every time I do, I say, thank you, God, for forgiving me that sin. And help me not to do it. Help me get over this, man. But God has redeemed me and forgiven me of all sins, given you all sins. We are secure, free from condemnation. You hear that all the time. Oh, you're, oh, you're not good. You, you know, you're a failure. Don't, you know, the condemnation. Oh, why did you do that? You can't be a good Christian. You can't. Condemnation. I'm free from that. That, that language is not from God. <laughs> That's from the enemy. He, God is not condemning you. I cannot be separated from God's love. Another point in there. And down at the bottom, I, I, I've been given the spirit I've not been given the spirit of fear, but of power and of love. An insignificant purpose. I've been chosen and appointed uh, to bear fruit. I'm a, I am a personal witness for Christ wherever I go, and I'm a minister of reconciliation. That's who you are. That's your inheritance. And God, like in the Old Testament, wanted to give them a land and give them a place where the world would be attracted to. He is, he is uh, as the resurrection of Jesus Christ we celebrated two weeks ago, he, his, his spotlight is on the church. It's on you and me. We're the church. The church is not this building. It's not, it's not the, uh, the organization. The church is us. And when the, and when the service is over, the church will leave the building. And as you go... There is, uh, there is this life, there is this, there is this power, there is this, uh, this purpose that God is at work in us to impact all Douglas County, all of Oregon and around the world. It's 
So we have, we've inherited a new identity. That's what we have now in Christ. A promise and be strong and courageous in that promise. There was another uh, thing that God wanted them to know, wants us to know, and it starts again, and, and we look at this in verse number 7. Be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the law my servant Moses gave you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left, that you may be successful. I love that. That you may be successful wherever you go. Keep this book of the law always on your lips. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything that is written therein. Then you will be prosperous and successful. Then you will be prosperous and successful. I remember as a 17-year-old reading this and actually memorizing this verse because I was getting ready to step away from home into my life and to college or career or wherever, and I didn't, I didn't want to mess it up. I wanted, I wanted to be prosperous and successful. And I can remember memorizing this and meditating on that. And one of the things, I, I, I spent some time learning many scriptures, and I can tell you, it was the most valuable thing I think I ever did because I, when, when you are, are keeping the word of God on your lips and you have it in your mind, then every time the enemy wants to eclipse you, the spirit of God wants to speak. Some people say, you know, I pray all the time, but, and I'm asking God for, uh, you know, from some direction here. And, uh, and I'll say, so where are you reading in the scripture? Well, you know, I just haven't had much time to do that. So that's like talking into the phone and, and, and you know, not listening to the... The Spirit, what's the Spirit going to say? He's going to say what's in the Word of God. He's going to remind you. He's going he's to give you hope and encouragement from God's Word. When, when, when Jesus was in the garden uh, fighting Satan, Satan was using the Scripture. The Satan knows the Scripture better than you do. So you better armor up. So, so there's this, this um, power from God's word to keep it on their lips, meditate on it, and to God's power is activated through God's word. God's power is activated as we hear it, as we speak it, as we meditate on it, and as we obey it. So Joshua is getting ready to cross over to the land, and um, and God says, cross over. And in the season that they're in, in the, at the Jordan River, it's at flood stage. Just a couple weeks ago or so, um, the Umpqua was at flood stage. Um, that's not necessarily the time that I want to be crossing the river, swimming the river or whatever. But that was a time because God was showing him how big he was. And, he, and they crossed over uh, the river uh, on dry ground as God proved and showed his power. But there were some things they had to do. They had, there were some things they had to obey. There were some things they had to do to prepare. They weren't just going to go walking without doing it the way God said. When they crossed over, they, the first place they went to was a place called Jericho. It was a walled city. It had uh, lots of people and walls, and they had all the ways to fight this battle, and there was no way that this group of people was going to be able to conquer that city without God. So God came up with a plan. Probably not the plan that, jo that Joseph would have come up with, but it was a plan. March around the city for six days, and on the seventh day, march around it seven times, blow the trumpet, and everybody yell. What? March around. Now, if we march around, then they're going to know we're here. They're going to be, they're going to shoot, you know. They did it as God said, it, and, they, and, and the walls of Jericho fell and God fought that battle for him. The next one was Ai, or I. Was, and it was a little city with, uh, with no walls. And they went up to fight that battle. And they said, oh, this will be easy. They weren't, need, they weren't trusting God like they were in Jericho. And they lost the battle because they did not trust God. And they did not follow God's command in how they should take care of the plunder. If you obey God, he will make the big he will win the big battles. And when you don't, you think, oh, I got this one. You'll be defeated by the little ones and the big ones. In 
in, uh, for us today, we're in a battle. We have Satan who wants to take us out. And Satan uh, will do everything that he can to stand between us. And here in 2 Corinthians uh, 10, 3 through 5, it says, For though we live in this world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, we have divine power to demolish strongholds. We have this divine power to, dis, to, to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretentious pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. We have a battle, and the battle is, is not with flesh and blood. The battle is in our mind. That battle is, you can't do this, or, you, you're, or we, we think we can, but there's this battle going on, and often the, God is eclipsed, and we are fighting a battle and, and losing, or not even fighting the battle at all. But when I think of this list, the church can fight a battle when we are um, reminding ourselves of our inheritance. This is who I am. And, the, and if the devil can't keep you from, from being a, a child of God, he wants to definitely keep you from seeing the power that you have in God. But when the church knows who they are, knows the power the, in, that Christ is bringing in them and the victory that can come in, as followers of Jesus, then the church can accomplish what God has. But it takes all of us. The, it, when, when, uh, when all of us are believing the truth and all of us are following God and all of us are committed and all of us are, are, are marching with, as strong and courageous then God can do some powerful things. And so, God's power also demolishes strongholds. A stronghold is that, that thing that captures your heart. It's the thing that you are uh, often stuck with. It could be an addiction. It can be, a, uh, it can be a thought process. It can be a fear. It can be something that is, just seems to paralyze you it seems to stop you it seems like we can go so far but there's always there there's always this 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 place that just it, it i can only go that far that's a stronghold and you identify that stronghold you bring it to god and god will fight that battle with you lastly in verse number nine he says do not command do, do, have i not commanded you be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not, do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. Amen. The Lord God will be with you. Do not be discouraged. Don't be in fear. Don't, don't give up. I don't know what you're facing today. But don't give up. Don't be discouraged. If you... If, you, if you're feeling like you're on the losing side and you feel like everything is about to, to fall around you, it's because God has been eclipsed. And what God wanted them to know is that He is always near. He is always near. The sad part in the story of these people who were given the land, they went in and saw many battles and they, they were able to take possession of the land, but they never experienced the rest, the ability to just go, okay, no more war. Um, they never truly, fully obeyed God. And today, when you look at, at, at Israel, what do you think of? Are they still, you know, are, are they... Do they have this vast land? They're not even occupying what God had given them. And they're at war and will always be at war until Christ comes again. 
But God is near. And when we are in worry and doubt and fear and unrest and uncertainty, this is a wonderful prayer. The, the Apostle Paul tells us in four, Philippians 4, 6, and 7, do not be anxious, do not be worried, do not be fearful, do not be um, overcome, don't be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And what will happen? And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. And the peace of God. When you think of, when you think of fear and peace, do they ever, do they, are they roommates? <laughs> One of the evidences is that the Spirit of God is alive in you and the Spirit of God is in His rightful place is peace. It's that, it's that, it's that stillness that God is, is, is at work is peace. Let, when you lose peace, realize that something's not right. Let the peace of Christ move in your hearts because when you take your worry, you take your problem, you take your, the, the challenge and you pray to God and you continue to pray and when, you, when, when, when prayer turns to faith, then peace follows. Let me tell you my most, the scariest time in my life. 25 years old, Robin and I had just got married a year before. Uh, because of looking for work, we moved to the East Coast from, from Oregon. And uh, trying to settle in and get acquainted and get um, housing and all the things that needed to, to happen... And in all of that, we found out we were pregnant. It was uh, six months into that pregnancy that uh, Tim came. Three months early. Uh, we were not prepared. <laughs> and uh, he came uh, three pa uh, two pounds, two ounces. I'd never even heard of a preemie before. I was so naive, just an old country boy out here not knowing a whole lot about that kind of thing. Um, boy, it was, a, it was a learning for us. Uh, the doctor said, um, don't get your hopes up, which started in me, fear. It was about uh, 24 hours later that we got the report that uh, he had a, a rare lung disease called Nickety Wilson, and only a very few children survive. Don't get your hopes up, fear. I can remember st um, looking back uh, and, and some of that, uh, even at the time, I, heard, I was standing at the at, at, as, uh, in, in fear of loving my son. You know, I would, on top of that, the, the hospital that he was born in was condemned. The only thing left, everybody else had moved to the new hospital except maternity and in ICU. So we were walking down these darkened hallways, very few people, kind of a dead hospital, and walk into the room where we were to wash our hands and get us prepared to go into the NICU. And it was like walking into a, a janitor's closet. It was just very sterile and unfriendly. And we were just feeling so out of place and awkward, and then walking into the, um, being into the room with all the alarms going off and the isolates and the incubators, and I walk in, and there is my son that I was escorted to, uh, to be with. Tubes, wires, lamps, all this thing, and, and over the next few days, I'm just trying to take all of this in, and I can... I, I, go, I, I recall that I was standing next to my son refusing to love him. 
You say, how, how, how is that? Because I, I was full of fear and wanting per, to protect myself. Anx, anxiousness, worry, and fear of the uncertainty of Tim's life paralyzed me emotionally. I realized my fear of, lo of loss and pain was hindering my ability to love him. I had a nurse tell us, they said, I don't think he's going to make it. Whatever you, want it you know, whatever you need to do, we just want you to know he's probably not going to make it. It was at that time it just kind of broke through and said, man, we weren't taking, you know, we were going to, we said, we're not going to take pictures, we're not going to even, you know, we just want to, we don't know what to do, you know. And it was that time I said, oh, I've, I've got to love him. You, there's a, there's a meter that, oxygen meter that are on these children, and, and if you touch them, you can actually see the oxygen meter go up. They, are, they feel the, the, the human connection of love got to love my child. And to, a few weeks later, I was reading in this passage in John 9, and, it's, and, the, and the question was, who sinned? Was it, was it, the, was it the, the, the little boy or his parents? Who was it that sinned that this, boy, this child was born blind? And the, and the passage says, neither. Neither. It was that God would be glorified. It would be that God would be glorified. And as I read that, God says, I'm going to be glorified whether your son lives or whether he dies. He's going to be glorified. All of a sudden, all of a sudden, I had purpose. I had a promise. I had a, I had a power to face my fear because whatever was going to happen, I knew that God was being glorified and I, would, I had offered my son to him and saying, God, he's not mine, he's yours. You be glorified and if you're glorified whether he lives or whether he dies, God, I belong to you. He belongs to you. You know what followed? Peace. Peace. And today, <laughs> he survived. He was in the hospital four and a half, five months. Um, $200,000 $200, bill that God provided. But today, he's a children's pastor in, on the East Coast in Pennsylvania. God is good. And as his church... God wants to accomplish his mission in the world. And his church must be strong and courageous. That's you and me. When, when we live out this promise, people will see the power of God. And in every battle we face, we will experience peace when we're walking in it with God. If we, if we let God be eclipsed and we live in fear and we live, don't live up to the inheritance that God has given to us, we all lose. The world loses. We lose. The church loses. Rise up. Be strong and courageous. I like to released to our campuses. A couple things to take away. On a scale of 1 to 10, how would you score yourself this week? As you think about your week, how much of it was, was gripped by fear and how much of it was trusting God in fear and peace? Just give, your, give yourself a number. Are you, what was your week like? And then as you look at, evaluate that, what will this week look like? And then what must change to live in peace? 
what must change to live in peace? What, what could you take away perhaps from, from the message? And, and on the, uh, this week, there's also devotions that you can follow along with that will uh, remind you of the peace that you have. But what must change in your heart? What must change in your mind? What must change in your attitude to live in peace? Let's pray. Father, we're grateful that you have promised us an inheritance. God, we're so grateful that you are powerful, God, and you will exert your power through us as we trust you and we allow you to live and in, in, in work through us. And we're, we're grateful, Father, that even though the world around us seems to be coming at us at every angle, that peace is, is there when you are near and when we get, when we get you clearly in our view and, and, and we don't allow fear and, and, and trouble to eclipse you. So God, I pray that as we uh, evaluate ourselves and as we get ready for another week, that we will be strong and courageous. And may we stand for you, may we live for you, may we walk with you, and may the world see the church as this living, vibrant thing that, that draws all people to you. And, and people would just would come to you and say, what do you have that's different? And may God you be... May, you be a, a, may we be a blessing through us all around, wherever we go. May I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. If you're watching online, either because you're sick and can't make it or out of town, or maybe you watch online regularly, let me invite you to, while we are celebrating communion here at Family Church, to take, and take a few moments and celebrate communion right there in your own home, if you're able or wherever you might be. And I'm going to walk through a little bit of a teaching on it and just kind of help us understand it. But if you have a possibility of going and getting a cup, um, picking up some crackers, a loaf of bread, something that you can take and physically participate in this as we go through the process, it will be meaningful to you. And how you get the elements and what you put them in and if it's grape juice or wine or whatever you want to take, it's, those, those details really are not the point of it. The point of it is this is a spiritual exercise of, of examining ourselves, of reviewing what the truth is, and, the, and, and it's a spiritual moment that the scripture speaks of very highly. And so I'd like to lead you through that um, wherever you are right now. And if you have somebody or if you're able to, to go ahead and grab some crackers and grab some juice, then when we get to the end of this, we'll have an opportunity for you just to take a few moments as we are here at Family Church and celebrate what Jesus has done for us. So I'd, I'd like to read, first of all, from 1 Corinthians 11. And Paul is writing to a church that's actually doing it all wrong, and he's kind of trying to correct them, and so he brings in some things to, to bring this back to a point of worship. He says, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it. So Paul wasn't there. He didn't come to be a follower of Jesus till after that. And so evidently, Jesus had communicated to him that this is how he was supposed to, to remember that what had happened. And so he, Paul, like us, wasn't there in person, so this is his way of reviewing and remembering that. And so it says, Jesus broke the bread and then he said, this is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup and he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. To proclaim is to, to share something as true and to, to, again, review it and remember that. And so he's saying whenever you go through this exercise, you are reminding yourself, you are saying, wow, this is what happened. And, and Jesus' body was broken for me and, and his blood was shed for me. And I am now a part of the family of, of God. I am now forgiven. I am now included because of what Jesus has done. And then he goes on and gives a little warning. He said, So then, whoever eats the body or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and the blood of the Lord. So everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink from the cup. 
And, he, and he's dealing with a situation where they actually had a whole love fest, a, a big feast, and, and some people were coming, and they were hungry, and they were elbowing their way in, and they were getting a lot, and it, it turned into a, a, a kind of a wild party. And he was saying, man, that is dangerous. You've forgotten what this is about. But, but it's also a great reminder for you and I that before we take this moment and remember Jesus in this special way, he says, we're supposed to examine ourselves. What, what is my relationship with Christ like? Is there any sin? And I, and I think it's often appropriate just to stop and to pray and to say, God, is there anything in my life that's hindering you working? Is there, is there anybody I've offended? Is there anything that I, maybe it's a sin you clearly know that you committed and you just need to confess it. And, and maybe you think, I, I don't really think of anything that I've done specifically that was an act of sin. But you allow the Holy Spirit to point out where you've been selfish or where you've been misusing the, the resources God's given you or something that the Spirit points out. And that's, that's part of the function of not only examining yourself, as it says, but, but doing that and letting God examine you. And so there's that moment of, of kind of humility and of, of prayer and of asking God to show you and, and offering up and saying, God, thank you that your, your blood is sufficient to cover that sin too. I, confess I, I blow it all the time I'm, I'm a sinful person and thank you God for forgiving me and 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 you go through a period of time and examine and, and confess and and kind of like clear the plate and I I think it's important important for us to do that daily but it seems like when we celebrate communion there's kind of a, a big moment where you're saying okay I want to clear my heart and then and then he says we are to remember the body and blood of Christ and I then I think as you go through and as you take that bread you, you think about cross. You think about Jesus saying, not my will, but yours be done. And, and about his body that was, he was whipped and his the crown of thorns. And, and not to become gruesome or to focus on the gory part of it, but, but to realize that it, the cost that it was for him. This, this is a free gift for me, but ah, the cost was incredible. And, and, and when you think of the blood and the fact that it was shed for me, that that's the only way that sin is forgiven. In, in the Old Testament, it was a lamb that was killed and the, the, the throat was slit and the blood was put on the altar and that was a picture of the cost of sin. And so as you remember those things, you, you come to that moment of not only soberness, but it's, it's, we call it a celebration because you're thinking, wow, this is so incredible. And so you, you take that and, and then I encourage you and, I, and I'd like to just pray with you. And then when we're done praying, whenever you're ready, you, you take that bread and you take that cup and you say, Lord, in the name of Jesus, I, I remember you. I take this. And you, you eat the bread and drink, the, drink from the cup and, and let it be a, a spiritual moment for you. So I'd like to lead you in prayer. And um, if, if you'd like to spend a few moments after that uh, examining your heart and seeing if God would show you anything that you need to confess and then, and then go ahead and eat and, and drink whenever you're ready. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for those who are joining us online. And, and Father, all of us have things in our life where selfishness comes in and where bitterness comes and where, where we allow fear to control us instead of you. And I ask that you would just lead us, God, to confess whatever it is that might hinder our relationship or you working in us. And then I ask that as we eat this piece of bread, a cracker, as we drink this juice or this wine, that that we would do it as an act of worship, remembering and reminding ourselves how valuable and how important this is and, and saying how grateful we are to you. But God, thank you for loving us. Thank you for dying for us. Thank you for giving us this, this symbol to remind us because we are a forgetful people. In your precious name, amen. Now as the music continues, just go through that process wherever you are in that. We'll trust that this will be a special part of your worship today. Thank you.